Reminder to turn off all cell phones, pagers, blackberries, camera speakers, Euro phones, space meters, and the other audio producing devices that interfere with the audio recording of this month's briefing. Thank you. Why don't you and Togo come up here with me? Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, with me uh, this afternoon are former Secretaries of the Army Togo West and Jack Marsh, co-chairs of the Independent Rev Review Group, a panel I named after learning of unacceptable outpatient conditions at Walter Reed Medical Center. I want to thank all of the men and women of the Review Group for their service. I just met with the group, which consisted of nine distinguished military, medical, and political leaders. They all agreed to drop pretty much everything else in their lives and address this serious problem. They took a broad look at all of our rehabilitative care and administrative processes at both Walter Reed and the National Naval Medical Center. They were also allowed access to any other facilities they felt needed to be included. I asked them to complete their report in 45 days and to report on the conditions they found and create an action plan to fix any problems that they uncovered. They've done just that, and the Department's Health Affairs Division and the Army have already begun implementing some of their recommendations. Again, I'm grateful for their willingness to take on this challenge, uh, for the quality of their recommendations, and for meeting a very short deadline. Today I'm also announcing uh, the formation of an oversight committee of senior military and civilian officials that will be chaired by Deputy Secretary Gordon England. This strategy and oversight group will ensure that the recommendations of, of this review group, the President's Commission on Care for Returning Wounded Warriors, and the Interagency Task Force 
are promptly and properly integrated and implemented, coordinated and resourced. The committee will meet weekly and will consist of the service chiefs or the vice chiefs, the chairman or vice chairman of the joint chiefs of staff, as well as the senior civilian leadership from personnel and readiness, health affairs, and other relevant divisions of the Department of Defense. As I said, when the Walter Reed problems first emerged, our nation is truly blessed that so many talented and patriotic young people have stepped forward to serve. They deserve the very best facilities and care to recuperate from their injuries and ample assistance to navigate the next step in their lives. And that is what we intend to give them. Apart from the war itself, this department and I have no higher priority. I look forward to seeing some of these extraordinary men and women at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio later this week. During that trip, I also will meet with Secretary Dole and Secretary, with Senator Dole and Secretary Shalala, the co-chairs of the President's Commission. I'll now turn this over to the co-chairs of the Independent Review Group, Togo West and Jack Marsh, for a few comments. After their remarks, uh, we will take some questions. I'd appreciate it if you all could ask your questions on the review group first, and then I'll hang around and, and uh, take a few questions on unrelated matters. Please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, first off, thank you very much for your announcement of the new group that's uh, been appointed to help you oversee the implementation uh, and the review of the recommendations we made. If I could say there was a fondest hope and a greatest concern uh, for any review group such as this, it is what happens to the report. Where does it go? Who does anything about it? I think we've just heard about your intention to see that it goes front and center, uh, and that very responsible people in the department will be uh, focused on seeing that uh, it is reviewed and implemented. Uh, four questions um, in our work uh, pretty much summarize what we've looked at and what we've seen and what we've concluded. Um, first, who are we as a society? Uh, we say a lot about ourselves, about how we, uh, in the manner that we treat those who have been wounded in the service to the nation. Uh, and so. Uh, though we perceive ourselves as a nation that is grateful, that is honored by the service of its wounded veterans and service members, uh, and that shows its support, um, our reviews suggest that our service members and their families who are wounded have not always seen it that way. And thus our report contains recommendations for more caseworkers, um, the assignment of, uh, of physicians who will coordinate um, the work of others working on a particular case, uh, an improvement in attitude uh, in general, uh, how we show our gratitude to our wounded service members. Second question, where are we going? Uh, the BRAC process, the A76 process, have uh, taken an institution, a distinguished one like Walter Reed, uh, made its personnel uncertain as to the future of the institution, uh, perhaps a little fragile. Uh, we need to improve that. We need to review how those two processes apply to medical centers, and our report contains recommendations to that effect. We, we do not recommend that Walter Reed be taken off the back list, but rather that the process, since it is now underway, be expedited, expedited in whatever way is possible. The preparation at uh, Bethesda and at Belvoir to receive those functions get underway quickly uh, and be advanced. Uh, thirdly, what's happening to our service members in this wartime context? Uh, the advent of IEDs, their concussive impacts on the brains and the psyches of our service members uh, means that uh, of the four signature wounds, injuries, that we identify in our report, one is having a most profound impact, uh, traumatic brain injury. In our report are recommendations with respect to how we might respond to that as a society and within the Department of Defense and in VA as well. Uh, the major recommendation, of course, is for a center of excellence um, to be established, not one that already exists, a new one, that can bring together all the aspects of both understanding this and dealing with it for our service members. And we encourage the Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs to cooperate in this endeavor and to be willing to accept 
outside support and participation as well. And then the fourth question is how long? <clears throat> the physical disability review process, the medical evaluation process is lengthy and segmented and has many different parts. To those of us within the departments who understand how it works, it all seems logical. But to vulnerable service members and their families, it seems a contradictory mass of several sequential uh, reviews, uh, of several sequential decisions, uh, compounded by confusing regulations uh, at a time when they are most vulnerable and least able to follow them. Um, our recommendation, among several in our report, of course, is that every effort be made to make that into one process um, that involves both departments within the Department of Defense, the, the military departments, as well as the two cabinet level departments. Um, this has been an extraordinary experience for every one of the nine members that have been part of the IRG. Um, of it, this quick, almost life-changing 45 days, one experience looms largest for me. And that is when I and several of our members went out to the airport uh, at Andrews Air Force Base to see the daily plane, well, except for Thursdays, that brings our wounded service members back from launch to uh, here to Andrews, uh, sometimes within 36 hours of their having been wounded on the battlefield for the complicated surgery and attention that they will require either at Walter Reed, at the National Naval Medical Center at Bethesda, or at one, or at one of the other medical centers. There, on that plane, as part of that marvelous system that has brought them back from the battlefield, uh, uh, brought them into a, uh, a steady state, transported them uh, by the United States Air Force back on those pallets, on those stretchers, are what America regards as her heroes. They are more than that. They are parts of America herself. I, my colleagues on the IRG, have been pleased along with those who served them in our medical centers to have served them. Thank you. Well, thank you, Togo, and also thanks to our Secretary of Defense who uh, made every uh, uh, service and agency of the Department of Defense available to us, a complete cooperation directed to the Department of Defense and the medical community and others to assist us in this uh, very important project. You know, the uh, care of the wounded soldier uh, is a part of our national ethic. And it had been damaged somewhat by these reports in reference to things that had happened at military hospitals, particularly uh, in one phase of the stay at, at Walter Reed. And we want to reestablish that. And members of our committee, and incidentally, some of the members of the, of the committee are here, a number of them are, and they have the expertise uh, on many of these subjects that relate to medicine and airlift and in questions we may want to call on them to give you an answer. But if you uh, look at what we were seeking to do uh, and the secretary gave us a deadline of 45 days, actually we were had completed slightly before that. But the, it, it was broad but it was limited. It was limited principally to Walter Reed and collaterally in a more incidental way, to the National Medical Center at Bethesda, the Naval uh, Medical Center uh, at Bethesda. Uh, those were the, the principal objects of, of, of our attention. The perfect storm that uh, Secretary West mentioned it was very apparent at, at, at Walter Reed. But I think it's also important that we realize that there are two phases to this medical delivery service. The first of that is the one that was referred to, the trauma situation, wounding, attention and care on the battlefield, thence uh, through evacuation stations to Lonsdale, Germany, and then airlifted uh, back in the United States. And there, a period of hospitalization. That dimension of our medical program is superb. Everywhere we went, whether it were patients or uh, other members of other services, all gave high marks to that. Where it fell down was what might be termed the second phase at Walter Reed, where the individual completes the hospitalization, is then placed in outcare or outpatient status, and there 
goes into a title called either a holdover or medical holdover, depending on whether they're guard or reserve or active. And that is a very substantial population. The population of that group today at Walter is probably around 640, 650 uh, outpatients who are necessary uh, that they stay in the area uh, in order to obtain the, the medical attention. There it was breaking down and broke down very, very severely. And this is an area that we want to correct and we feel is being corrected. And I would call to the press's attention to the fact that the Army did an, an IG report that confirmed many of the things. Uh, that, that I have said about that uh, post-hospital treatment, and that is the area that we need to address. Some of these things can be addressed by the Department of the Army. Some can be addressed by the Department of Defense. Some will have to be addressed by the executive branch of government, for example, questions that relate to A-76 or, uh, or Office of Personnel Management Records. Others, others will have to be addressed by the Congress of the United States. They will require legislation uh, to, uh, to uh, reconcile areas of jurisdiction and responsibility between the Department of Defense uh, and the Veterans uh, Affairs uh, uh, Department of, of our national government. There's, there is a place here for Congress to exert its leadership, uh, which will be essential for successful resolution of this. Uh, uh, we prepared to try and respond to your questions. There, there has been reporting on some of these problems in the military medical system and including at Walter Reed going back to 2003. Do either of you or did the IRG at all develop any insight at all as to why it took so long and why it took an expose from the Washington Post to get action on these problems? Let me <clears throat> put it this way. We are engaged in a shooting war in two th combat theaters. Um, the numbers uh, that result from that uh, of the wounded, uh, combined with the extraordinary uh, advances in medical care from our military uh, medical personnel, uh, means that we have, for want of a better term, a kind of ongoing surge of patients through our flagship medical institution, Walter Reed. That kind of a stressor, that kind of a push will always show the weaknesses in the system much more clearly than the more ordinary period of, of peace where, where a system is able to function even when there are little cracks that are developing there. Um, I think that is the reason we see it now. I don't have the answer for the original question you asked for, why didn't we see it sooner? I think a system which is producing extraordinary medical care uh, and where you can do what I did during, uh, during one afternoon is go sit in the, in the uh, reception area uh, at Walter Reed Medical Center and just talk to whoever happened to come in, true outpatients, outpatients who are not at the medical center but who are living outside, and say, well, how's it going? What do you think? Not a one said anything other than, so glad it's here, best medical care, best treatment. Well, if you're getting that on a regular basis, then you miss what may be happening with I don't know, electrical wiring or what you might see if we're asked to open up for billeting places we haven't had before or if we've just had uh, a much larger number, 650 at one time, 800, in a medical hold uh, facility that didn't have nearly that many before. Uh, additionally, we uh, in the report noted that there was a breakdown in a system or methodology of reporting complaints and concerns. We did, there were some uh, soldiers who had indicated that they tried to complain about it, but nobody listened. One of the things we were recommending is that there be established an oversight system whereby you can make those complaints and they'll move uh, immediately uh, to, the, to the senior levels of, of, the, of the command. I guess the other thing, I correct the record too. Actually, the complaints were heard. Remember that the Secretary Marsh referred to a very detailed Inspector General report of the Department of the Army. That was commissioned more than a year ago uh, and, and, and took a year to, to go through, and that was based on concerns that had been developed. So all of those factors come into play. Have you come up to a conclusion or a sense of why the disability board seemed to have such a hostile 
uh, opinion in, in giving out their evaluations, or the physical evaluations, uh, to the outpatients. Because that's where most of the complaints seem to be, that these evaluators were giving low uh, percentages whereby they just couldn't go forward. Let, let's, let's let Dr. Roadman, if we could, Mr. Sure. Secretary, talk about that. Um, we, we all have some, some ideas, and you have our report, but he spent a lot of time on it. Dr. Roadman is the former Surgeon General of the United States Air Force. Uh, I, think, I think that's a, uh, a, 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 an excellent question, and it looks as though uh, systems uh, were in place to limit uh, uh, benefits awarded rather than uh, try to make decisions that benefited the uh, soldier, sailor, or airman. And, and our concern is uh, that that system needs to be relooked at and the, the uh, leadership and, uh, and culture of, uh, of that needs to be uh, completely reworked. Uh, and that was part of our report. It, it was the feeling of the IRG that if we take a uh, young male or female out of their community and they serve in the, in the services and we return them back to their community, not in the same shape that they were, that uh, we need to either fix that or compensate them. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a different mindset uh, than what has, what, has, what has evolved. My view, and it's my own personal view, Mr. Secretary, as I, uh, as I, as I give this, is that, that the PDES system is a draft era, uh, 20th century uh, bureaucratic system that we're trying to uh, adapt to a, an all-volunteer force uh, in the 21st century. And quite frankly, they don't, uh, they don't quite mesh. Uh, and, the, and the soldiers, sailors, and airmen are, uh, and Marines are actually getting caught in that trap. Uh, as you know, in our report, we recommended a very thorough review retrospectively uh, to assure consistency, uh, thoroughness, and fairness of, uh, of those decisions. If I could just follow up, but what you mentioned, though, is a 30-year lag time between the draft and the all-volunteer force. That, that all of a sudden this came out uh, to the public knowledge. Well. You know, as you frame that with public knowledge, I, I, I think the real issue is this is a system uh, that has evolved over time uh, that, quite frankly, as we deal with new diseases, uh, and uh, Secretary West and Secretary Marsh referred to uh, traumatic brain injury as an example. That would be a poster child uh, disease of uh, uh, conditions that actually uh, we don't believe the PDS has prospectively been able to, uh, to take care of. So we're seeing different injuries. Uh, we're seeing a scale that is uh, different in the number of people that are, uh, are coming back. That always stresses a system, but we also believe that there are a culture of a system that needs to be changed. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. okay. Secretary <coughs> Do you, do you support the uh, IRG's recommendation that Walter Reed stay on the BRAC list and that the uh, environmental impact study for Bethesda be accelerated or waived? I won't speak to the acceleration or the wave. I think, I think the general view of, of people that I'm talking to here in the department and as well as the IRG is that uh, it, that Walter Reed is still at this point a very old facility no matter how much money you put into it and far better to make an investment in brand new 21st century um, facilities at Fort Belvoir and at Bethesda and how can we accelerate uh, getting those facilities in place and how can you keep high quality staff at Walter Reed right up until the day uh, that people transfer uh, to one of the other hospitals. So. That's a roundabout answer to your question. <clears throat> I haven't, you know, right now the status is it is on the BRAC list. Uh, my own view is that it, at, based on what I know at this point, it probably ought to stay, but we ought to have the flexibility to make sure that it stays open until Bethesda and Fort Belvoir are completely ready uh, to take on the responsibilities of the patients and the staff that are at Walter Reed now. So there shouldn't be, Walter Reed should not be closed un unless those other facilities are ready to go, in my opinion. 
Mr. Secretary, in the, uh, um, uh, in the report, there are several recommendations that specifically mention changes to Walter Reed, like assigning a single position to a returning casualty. Um, I, I wonder why you didn't uh, uh, apply that, or, or even though the, the scope was meant to be Walter Reed and the National Naval Medical Center, to other facilities that are treating returning uh, casualties. Uh, I wonder why you didn't uh, um, include the verbiage uh, to, uh, to or extend that to, to other facilities that are treating, like, like uh, returning veterans, such as um, wounded veterans, such as uh, Brook Army Medical Center and so forth. And, and was that the intent to see DOD uh, the, uh, do that? That related to the charter that we were given. We were directly tasked to address the situation at Walter Reed and in a collateral way as that impacted on, on Bethesda. Uh, now, the Surgeon General who just spoke to you is very aware of the situation that, uh, at Bamsey Brook, Army, uh, Brook uh, Army Medical Center, and I'm sure he can speak to that because he, he raised issues about it to the... Yes, sir. We, uh, as the Secretary said, we actually went to several other facilities in order to be able to get a feel for uh, the the issues that we were seeing at uh, at Walter Reed and at uh, Bethesda, specifically, uh, we went to uh, San Diego uh, Naval Medical Center at Balboa. We went to uh, Wilford Hall uh, USAF Medical Center in San Antonio and Brook Army Medical Center in uh, in San Antonio. the The important thing to keep in mind, and and I'm, I'll get around to your 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 question, but the important thing to keep in mind is the scale of the number of returning casualties at, uh, at Walter Reed, in, in military terms, overran uh, the systems, uh, and, and so they became, they became apparent. The, the level of care being delivered at, uh, at the other facilities uh, is, quite frankly, much smaller uh, and therefore uh, much more manageable. The, uh, your, your question about uh, having a primary physician assigned to uh, philosophically, that's uh, the issue of health care in America. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things that, we, ha that we, we have in our report, not stated explicitly, but inpatients are really in and outpatients are really out. Uh, and that's true whether you look at civilian health care or, uh, or military health care. It's particularly acute if you have people that are in rehab uh, care on a, on a campus. Uh, so as you're reporting, you also need to, uh, to point out the difference between acute care and rehabilitative care, and those are fundamentally different, uh, different issues in, in, delivering, uh, in delivering care. And so you, you have to be able to differentiate those. We did think, uh, we do think that everybody should have a physician, uh, period. Uh, and, but what we saw at uh, Walter Reed and at Bethesda was Bethesda had actually cracked the code. They had a, uh, a, a holistic approach so that one trauma surgeon was responsible for the care of every one uh, of, of the patient and all the care they were getting. It's what uh, we called a very holistic uh, care for the, for the, uh, for the patient. Uh, quite frankly, at Walter Reed, the scale was so high that they, uh, they, could not, uh, they could not do that. We did point out that Bethesda is a model to be emulated, uh, and, uh, and quite frankly, uh, that's expandable over a great deal more even than military health care. Let me just add one, one thing to that. Although the charter of the group was to focus on Walter Reed and to a lesser extent Bethesda, I think I can assure you that all of the services, including the Army, are looking at this report in terms of how does it affect the other facilities in those services and what of these recommendations need to be applied elsewhere beyond uh, Walter Reed and, and, uh, and Bethesda. And frankly, that's one of the issues that, that this oversight group that I mentioned that Gordon England will chair is going to be looking at. On your uh, specific question, I think the view of the IRG is that the concept is a good one everywhere. Okay. The release we have here says that um, the Army has accomplished or is addressing 24 of the findings of the group um, out of the 26 recommendations. What are the two recommendations that they aren't pursuing yet and why aren't they pursuing them? Uh, let, let me say, I have no idea. Do you Some of the recommendations <coughs> deal with issues the Army 
cannot by itself take action on. So if legislation is required, for example, that's something the Army can't do by itself. And I would emphasize the Army is addressing Could you portions. Could you mics, please? Sir. The Army is addressing portions of the 24. I don't think I want to pretend that every issue that's raised in each of those 24 is something the Army has decisively dealt with, but they have uh, addressed themselves to each of those 24 areas in some fashion. Mr. Secretary Gates, I can ask you a question off topic here. Are we are we uh, done with uh, the secretaries? I don't want to subject them. To <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Thanks Thank a lot. you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Secretary Rice is in the Sharm El Sheikh, and she's not ruling out meeting with the Iranians. Uh, off to the side of the meetings there. Is, this, is that an indication that the Iraq study group's recommendation of meeting multilaterally in the region with uh, Iraq and Iran and Syria is uh, coming to fruition? Well, I think that, um, first of all, the Secretary, Secretary Rice would be the first to tell you that she's always been willing. Uh, we, first of all, we've always been willing to talk with the Iranians at the ambassadorial level in Baghdad. Second, she's always been willing uh, to meet with the Iranian foreign minister uh, in uh, as long as they were willing to forego on a broad range of issues if they were willing to forego enrichment. I think what what is what is different than what the uh, Iraq study group had in mind is that as I understand it and I haven't read her talking points so I don't really know for sure but as I understand it Whatever dialogue there is uh, on substantive matters, if she were to have a conversation uh, with the Iranian foreign minister, would be focused on trying to get the Iranians to stop destabilizing Iraq and to stop taking actions that result in the deaths of our, of our servicemen. So it'll be, my impression is that the dialogue, any dialogue that takes place will be focused on Iraq. Mr. Secretary, could I ask you about uh, the current process involving uh, Congress and the White House with regards to the supplemental? Uh, is it your view that a bill which could include benchmarks which could apply pressure to the Iraqi government would be helpful? You yourself have encouraged them to move swiftly with reconciliation legislation. Could a <coughs> supplemental bill which includes those goals, those benchmarks explicitly, be helpful? I think that the real issue, and I, I don't want to I really shouldn't uh, uh, say very much about this because the fact is the president's meeting with the uh, bipartisan leadership uh, right now. Uh, I think I think one of the issues will be uh, to what degree uh, are there consequences uh, involved if if one or another benchmark isn't met. But but I would defer, frankly, to the dialogue that's going on at the White House right now. That's probably probably well beyond what I just said and probably makes what I said irrelevant. Mr. Secretary, uh, during the debate over the supplemental, many members of Congress had argued that uh, the U.S. military operations, at least in Iraq, uh, could continue at the same level without being hampered at all by a lack of funding uh, well into July. Uh, what is the time frame at which the U.S. military would start to feel the pinch of not having this supplemental passed? Well, First of all, we will take every action necessary to, uh, for as long as possible, that the that the troops in Iraq uh, not be impacted uh, by the failure to get the supplemental. The impact that we've been talking about, if the supplemental were not to be passed by April 15th, were not to be passed by May 15th, and so on, has really been on the disruptive impact on the Army here at home. Uh, in terms of, of and, and on the other services as monies are transferred uh, to cash accounts and, and so on to try and keep the flow of money supporting uh, the war in Iraq uh, uh, flowing. So the consequences that we've been talking about on the Hill and, and uh, internally really are focused on, on what happens here at home in terms of delaying construction, delaying uh, uh, some kinds of training, de de delaying hiring, delaying travel, delaying um, um, 
those kinds of things. So it's really it's really more focused on the on the situation here at home. Sir, uh, the administration has staked so much on this issue of timelines and inserting them into the operational picture that it would completely and fundamentally, apparently, undermine the effort in Iraq. And certainly there are those who believe that, that timelines are not going to undermine the effort. Can you just talk a little bit more here now again about why telegraphing this, this intention to the enemy really changes the fight in Iraq? And, I think it's. I think it's. You know, as 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 was pointed out, I've uh, I've talked about how I've thought that the uh, debate on the hill was uh, useful in terms of uh, letting the Iraqis fully understand uh, impatience here at home uh, and the importance of their getting on with uh, their domestic reconciliation and the importance of the political reconciliation as you know, to the success of uh, the enterprise um, in Iraq. But I think, I think it's actually a pretty straightforward matter. If you pick a certain date and say the troops are coming out on a certain date, everybody basically just gets to sit back and say, okay, we've got uh, 90 or 100 days that we've got to wait. Uh, all we have to do, all that Al Qaeda and and uh, Jay Shamadi and all the rest have to do is say, you know, we've got X days uh, until these guys are gone. Uh, so, um, husband your resources. Uh, all we have to do is uh, uh, make the run for uh, run for the money in a sp in a specific period of time. As long as there's some uncertainty about that, it seems to me that they don't have that luxury. But if you can put a timeline out for us into next year, is there not enough time for the Iraqis to, to build up? And also, doesn't that have a value to diffuse the situation here uh, to some degree and the debate goes away to some degree and, and you can all speak, uh, kind of move forward? Well, I don't think any of the time, as far as I know, none of the timelines, I mean, the, the front end of the specific timelines were not next year, they're this year. Thank you. Uh, Mr. One Secretary, one. if I could just uh, ask one last question. The, uh, it, have you been talking to members of Congress about your meetings with the Iraqi government in the recent weeks and talking to them about sort of what effect their debate has had on Iraq? And is there a role for you, seeing as you're one of the administration uh, figures with the most credibility on the Hill at this point, uh, in terms of working out a uh, compromise between the White House and, and Congress? Uh, no, I, I mean my um, uh, my talks, uh, my most recent talks with the Iraqis and the ones that were probably the most uh, candid uh, were just uh, two weeks ago, and uh, I ended up having to turn around and make another trip last week. So I have not had an opportunity to sit down um, with anybody Are from the Hill. To meet with members of Congress on this. Or? I'm happy to meet any time they want. Thank you all.